Thanks, Ejun. Hi, everybody. We'll get started. So I'm going to take us through the uh, new feature content in the Atoms 2017 release. Um, four major new features, Python scripting, uh, advanced 3D contact and Atoms machinery gear, a uh, series of extensions to the FE part, and uh, FMI model import, as well as a number of other uh, miscellaneous improvements that uh, we'll describe. We'll get started. Python scripting phase one. So this is the first phase of a multi-release, uh, multi-year project whereby we are um, adding a new option, a new scripting language alternative to the Adams View uh, CMD language uh, that is Python-based, which is a far more efficient scripting language, particularly for business logic type uh, portions of your scripts than the View CMD language. Um, what we have done is not implement a CMD translator. Uh, so this is actually a direct Python interface to the Atoms modeling database. Um, as opposed to, say, a translator that would translate Python into CMD and then CMD would issue the commands to the database to build parts, delete parts, modify them. That's not what we're doing here. It's a direct Python interface there, so, uh, so a, a lot of efficiency and speed gains there as well. Um, I do want to be very clear that this is not a CMD replacement. Uh, the Atoms View command language is going to continue on. New features uh, in this release and next releases uh, in the indefinite future will continue to be supported by CMD. Uh, CMD will continue to be fully supported. This is simply a, an alternative for folks, um, particularly folks that uh, um, are really interested in Python and uh, like the, uh, some of the capabilities and scripting uh, efficiencies that it brings. This first phase in Atoms 2017 um, covers um, most of the Atoms view modeling activities. So really anything you can do to create objects in the database that fall into the pre-processing category of things, uh, building parts, constraints, joints, deleting them, modifying them, data elements, um, all those kinds of things. Basically setting up the model. In the future, uh, subsequent phases, beginning with releases next year, we'll be adding more things. Um, model save as Python, um, simulation uh, activity, post-processing activity, extending this to cover uh, verticals, Adam's car and Adam's machinery products, as well as covering some of the commands to do customization of the environment and, uh, and handling of macros and things like that. So we do want this to become a full, uh, you know, a, a full feature coverage of CMD, and uh, we again be rolling that out in pieces over the next uh, next uh, several releases. A little more detail about how this looks and feels within Adam's view. Uh, access to the Python uh, for Python scripting is through either a file import. You can, there's now on the file import menu a file import to uh, Adam's view Python file. Um, you can also type Python commands directly into the command window, and there's a toggle in the lower right corner of the command window uh, whereby you can uh, switch from switch the mode from Python to uh, CMD and back and forth. Also, a big part of what is released with this is copious amounts of documentation. Uh, the online help has overview of sort of the structure and philosophy of the Atoms Python interface here. Uh, and then it, there is gory details, class by class details, method by method details of, uh, of how to write uh, the classes and methods that uh, directly generate things in the, uh, and, and modify things in the Atoms uh, modeling database. There are also a number of examples, new feature example as usual, but then some other examples as well referenced in the documentation, example Python files that build models that are um, packaged in the installation of Atoms. A final note uh, on this topic, we will be moving to Python 3 next year, uh, calendar year 2017. Currently we're on Python 2.7x right now. Uh, moving to Python 3, Python 3 does have some syntactical and structural changes, uh, uh, as Python gurus tell me. What we have implemented in this phase with regards to the Atoms Python interface is Python 3 compatible. Um, but that said, if someone gets going in Atoms 2017, writing your own Python um, around uh, some of the uh, you know specific Atoms specific things, um, you may want to be careful that you're uh, uh, you know, getting up to speed on Python 3 and what some of the changes there are, so that you don't have a lot of uh, um, 
editing and correction to do to make things Python 3 compatible next year. Okay. Another feature I want to talk about is Adam's Machinery Gears, a new method for gears. We've added a method called Advanced 3D Contact. Uh, this is a new method and aimed at uh, representing tooth flexibility in the gear pair. So the way this works is you're very similar to how you do today. You input a set of characteristic dimensions of the gear. In this case, uh, it accepts some more, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but what happens then behind the scenes is um, uh, a meshing job, not an auto mesh, but a, uh, a regular mesh. I mean, I suppose it's automatic for the end user here, but it's not an arbitrary mesh. It is um, code specifically made for putting a regular mesh uh, adapted for an involute gear tooth uh, on there. And then that mesh is used to run an FEA job behind the scenes, wholly embedded in atoms. It's based on NASTRAN technology that we've embedded in atoms, but there's no FEA package you have to have, MSC or otherwise. Uh, for this to happen, or licensing MSC or otherwise, uh, in terms of an FEA, uh, uh, from an FEA standpoint, to make that happen. And so that, um, again, that goes on and meshes the uh, meshes and does some calculations. What it does essentially is run um, a series of uh, short NASTRAN jobs in the background, uh, a number of them to, uh, you know, uh, uh, press a couple of gear pairs, uh, teeth together into each other a number of different ways so that they can calculate the compliance in the gear pair, basically, tooth to tooth compliance. Calculates that, then there's some, uh, then there's some activity whereby behind the scenes it generates essentially a uh, compliance matrix that can be referenced by a G-force in atoms is essentially the representation of the gear-to-gear -gear contact that you have in Adam's view. All you really have, you don't have uh, flexible bodies in Adam's, you have a G-force that's based on this pre-calculated compliance. So at runtime in Adam's, when you simulate, you've got a G-force that's, uh, that's uh, looking some things up with regards to the tooth compliance. And then there's some post-processing capabilities. I'll talk all about this in a little more detail here in the next couple of slides. So this is available through um, Adams Machinery Gears uh, embedded in Adams View as well as Car and Driveline. Currently uh, functions for cylindrical gears only, so straight and helical cylindrical gears. Uh, in the future, we very much want to be moving this towards bevel gears uh, and hypoids and other things uh, in the future. Um, this can account for many uh, common microgeometry modifications. Um, I talked a little bit about the contact algorithm already, so it's, it's not an analytical stiffness assumption. Again, there's a numerical basis for this. Um, it accounts for surface-to-surface -surface contact and coupled deformation of the teeth. Uh, friction, viscous, and structural damping, all those types of energy loss terms are, uh, are available. It has rather fast runtime performance. The contact detection itself can be done in a couple of ways. Uh, it can be done uh, during runtime, or we could also do a pre-computed contact detection prediction, which uh, lacks a little bit of accuracy but uh, gains a lot of speed, uh, a very popular option with some folks. Uh, and there's also a rigid tooth option, and you may be saying, well, why bother with a rigid tooth option here? I already have you know, two other <laughs> rigid tooth options available to me in Adam's machinery gear. Here, however, the contact detection is still very nice compared to even the 3D contact that we have today. The 3D contact that we have in there today in Adams 2016 is based on tessellations and standard Adams contact, whereby you can get some noise in those contact results because it's tessellating the surface of geometry and using that. Here we have a very, very fine meshes of, um, of the gear teeth. so. That kind of contact, those kind of problems you get with noise and things are, are, are uh, generally avoided, typically avoided, and you get smoother, typically smoother results uh, in the contact force, even at the rigid, uh, even if you employ the rigid assumption with this, uh, with this method. In terms of post-processing, um, I want to make a few points here. Again, a lot of typical, you know, uh, auto-generated requests that you would expect with a gear pair. Um, a few other things that will also come into play here that are very nice. We can look at um, the contact pattern. Uh, so look at the pressure distribution along the flank of the tooth, you know, and the radially out from, uh, say, the center of the gear along one axis and then across the width here on the longer, it's shown as a longer axis in this picture, you can then see the uh, the contact pressure 
on a given tooth in given time ranges or over the uh, uh, set of the analysis, and there's some automation in there that will allow you to create this for all teeth or number of teeth, uh, certain time frames, et cetera. And then another thing I want to point out on here is, uh, you know, of course, there's load between the teeth is also um, uh, also possible to, um, to plot out, and there's some nice automation in the plot in here to sort of always call tooth zero the tooth that is participating, uh, sort of the center tooth is participating in the contact. And in this case, what you can tell here is that a very at a, at a low load, um, there's pretty quick transition from one tooth to the other. Pretty much either you either have here in this case tooth zero or tooth T1 meaning positive and there's some uh, documentation in there uh, about the, the sign conventions or I guess the naming and numbering conventions of teeth. But, you know, an adjacent tooth in one direction, it's a pretty close, it's a pretty, uh, a, a pretty clean trade-off, let's say. It's basically one tooth or the other participating. Uh, but then if we add uh, more load, into the gear system, you can see that more teeth are now participating uh, simultaneously. Again, sort of proof that we've got um, tooth compliance is taking uh, taking effect here. Why do people want to use this kind of uh, modeling methodology? Uh, for one, uh, they are interested in gear tooth profile uh, contact pressure patterns, like we talked about. Uh, earlier, for sure, that's uh, that's a very nice uh, visualization and a nice bit of uh, information for someone to have who's uh, looking at the system effects on the gear pair. Uh, also, maybe they want to look at how the gear tooth deformation can affect the contact forces. So the kinds of thing I was talking about there: how many teeth are participating during what portions of uh, uh, what portions of the analysis when particularly of interest in those high load portions and how that transition is coming along. And uh, there's also some nice requests in here for transmission error, something we don't uh, don't have in other cases. So, you know, uh, good way to look at the whole system again. You know, we've got flexible teeth. This is uh, the flexibility of the tooth is playing a part, and of course, uh, flexibility of the shaft and all the other load propagation through the system, compliance in the bearings, the rest of the system all all sums up to uh, getting to good uh, transmission error, also looks at uh, transmission efficiencies and you know, power loss. These kinds of things are very well, it's very well suited for these kinds of things. We also have some customers who um, find flexible teeth very necessary to combat some kinds of MVH problems. Um, you can start getting into some, some ability to address gear wine. We've had some customers having some success with that. Okay, moving on to the extensions in this release for the FE part. One of them is the fact that uh, we've added another capability for parameterization with regards to the set of nodes that define the beam-like uh, FE part structure. So this is a new option that allows the nodes to be tied directly to curve control points. So if you've got a center line defining your beam-like structure here, uh, and uh, that's based on, say, a B-spline with some control points and atoms, um, Today, what would happen, Adam's 2016, I should say, what would happen is um, you can change that curve and the, the FE part will snap to uh, the new curve shape, uh, but the user entered S values that you have remain constant. So S being the, the cordial distance along the length of that curve, those values wouldn't change. So in this case, if we were to say, we've got a curve control point here in the top view in the lower left, we move that curve control point today, you're still gonna, the nodes will still uh, be using their currently, uh, the current value of S. So again, that may change if the shape changes, or the length of the beam changes, or the shape changes enough. S may be in a different position, but it doesn't change too much. Whereas if uh, you really want to be using the curve control points to control the mesh of nodes that is defining your FE part, your Adams FE part uh, beam, then you have this new option whereby that node, my uh, yellow triad here, uh, will follow that control point, the green uh, control point. To, straight away, directly. Um, another key extension to the FE part this release is its ability to support multi-threading. So this covers models whereby you may have multiple FE parts or even single very large FE parts, uh, in the, uh, a single very large FE part in the model. Uh, there's multi-threading capability there, which 
on a suite of models that we've tested around here, we've seen anywhere between, you know, 1.2 to 3.5x kind of speed up in those models, uh, throwing things around 2 to 8 threads. Also with the FE part, we have made some, uh, some improvements in the performance of FE part creation. So there's a very dramatic reduction in the processing time to create the FE parts themselves. So this applies to either both interactively or to importing CMD uh, scripts that uh, define the FE parts. Uh, again, in each of those cases, the creation of the FE part is, is executed, and that is now uh, over again a, a suite of models uh, where we have very large FE parts or models with many FE parts. Uh, we're seeing anywhere from 10 to 100 times speed up in that regard. So very big uh, performance gains there. Also, there's been a handful of smaller miscellaneous usability improvements. Um, we can use combinations of a point and marker to define a center line before you sort of had to use either one or the other. Uh, the generic section builder for building your own, drawing your own cross-section types. Uh, if you're not going to use the primitives that are, uh, that are off the shelf, you can draw your own. There's been some improvements in the organization of that dialogue, and uh, most notably making the cross-sectional uh, coordinate system convention follow that of what is employed by the FE part in the model itself. And there's uh, now distinct icon settings for the FE part, uh, distinct from the markers, that is. Okay, moving on to another topic, FMI model import. So uh, some folks may be new to the functional mock-up interface, but this is a, um, a standard in the CAE industry that many CAE tools support. It's a uh, model exchange and co-simulation standard. Uh, framework and standard that's out there. In ADAMS 2013.1, um, we introduced um, support for this framework in terms of co-simulation. So ADAMS Controls and ADAMS Mechatronic supports co-simulation with FMI tools um, in as of 2013.1. Uh, in this release, ADAMS 2017, we're now extending Controls and Mechatronics to support uh, model exchange, model import. So FMI has model exchange model import, which is akin to our uh, external system library import style of uh, multi-model simulation. So we have had for years in Adams Controls and Mechatronics uh, ESL import with uh, MATLAB Simulink models as well as EZ5 models. This is the case you're basically bringing in a DLL uh, representation of the other model, bringing that into Adams and. Uh, of solving, Adams does all the solving in that case, right? There's no need to have the other MATLAB or, uh, or EZ5. So now with uh, having model import capability, FMI model import capability, we can essentially do that same workflow, but now not limited just to MATLAB or EZ5, it's now extended to any of the FMI uh, supported uh, CAE tools. So any of the any of the FMI tools that can do model export, um, we can now uh, take those on in Atoms through model import into Atoms. And so this is really nice. It just you know extends the kind of problems that you can solve and extends uh, uh, the number of tools that you can can work in this manner. You know, essentially doing a uh, um, integration with another another model that, uh, but in a case where you don't necessarily have to have that other model software installed on your machine, uh, and just taking in the DLL into Atoms. All right, a number of other improvements I want to touch on uh, before we uh, before we open it up for questions and answers. Um, in Atom Solver, uh, HHT Integrator uh, has improved its convergence rate. Um, in 2016, uh, first order convergence was being observed, and in theory, we should have been seeing second order convergence rates. And so, what was happening was the HHT Integrator was using auxiliary accelerations rather than converged accelerations. And those two things can be very, very close in result, but slight differences could could crop up, and those would cause a small force and force imbalance that had to get rectified, and that affected the convergence rate. So you should see uh, more accurate displacement velocity acceleration results uh, in this release, and perhaps even noticeable changes in accelerations and forces for some kinds of models, as well as improved performance uh, for some kinds of models here. 
So if you're a heavy HHT user and you run your own set of uh, regression tests on things, let's say when you adopt a new version of ADAMS, when you move to 2017, uh, do take heed of this note here, and, uh, and and this may explain some changes and hopefully some improvements you'll see in some of your uh, uh, performance and regression tests as well. In Adam's car, uh, there's been uh, improved vehicle statics on uneven roads. This picture on the left, uh, while to a computer program, may seem like a fully valid static equilibrium. It's most of the time, not what somebody building a car or driving a car really wants their car to do um, as the first step from their design position. So uh, uneven roads, sloped roads, banked roads can sometimes result in these sort of strange uh, static configurations. Uh, and so there's been some improvements to avoid that and get to what we really would look like, uh, what we really intend, something like here on the right side. There's a new feature example uh, in there set around that. Also in Adam's car, the switch part uh, legend is included in subsystem file now. Previously, we just had an index, and you had to know what that index meant to know which switch part in the subsystem was, uh, which part was uh, the active part in the switch part. Uh, now we're getting those names in there. So nice little usability uh, feature there. Uh, in terms of ADM export, the Atom Solver dataset export, we have improved the consistency of handling significant digits and decimal places here. So function expressions will now interpret design variables that have been declared as a type real number, uh, actually interpret those as real numbers and apply uh, the logic, apply the settings of decimal places and significant digits that you specify within those function expressions. User functions, you know, when you're calling out things for subroutine, user parenthesis, blah, blah, blah. Those now are accounting for both the significant digits and decimal places settings. Previously, it was only accounting for decimal places. And uh, the documentation has been improved around this, particularly in the case where describing uh, how things are handled across the board. They're handled consistently, but how they're handled across the board when the specification for decimal places and number of significant digits conflict with each other. As you can imagine, that can happen uh, in a number of, uh, uh, for a number of value types. And this is covering ADM export anywhere, both Adams View or car-based uh, GUIs. Uh, this has been applied there. Lastly, uh, I want to make a few notes about the release. Um, in terms of platform support, uh, what you're seeing here in gray is what we had uh, in Adams 2016. It was released uh, uh, early part of, uh, late part of the spring, early part of the summer this year. What we have now for Adams 2017 is shown here. Uh, so same, same situation on Windows, Windows 7, Windows 10, and uh, higher versions of Red Hat Linux moving um, to 6.7 and 7.1 and uh, bumping up to SP3, uh, SUSE Linux 11 with this release. And this release uh, will be made available and uh, you'll get the usual email notifications when it's made available. Plans are to have this out before the end of the month, um, though I would wager it'll be before at least those of us here in North America leave for our holiday break the last week of uh, the last week of December. So uh, probably prior to that, more like mid-month. And as usual, there'll be a series of new feature examples included with the release, so you can take a look at these new features I've described uh, and uh, walk through some tutorials explaining how to use those as we usually do. That'll be on the download site uh, and a zip file next to the installers and release guides and all that stuff that we put out there with the, uh, the installation. So with that, uh, Eugen, I'll turn it back over to you and uh, make a few notes and I'll get us going with Q&A.